Welcome back to Stranded in Pittsburgh. We took a week off last week. It wasn't planned. And oh boy, was it a bad week to miss with so much happening. But don't worry, we're back now. And along the way, we found the one, the only, Ethan Morrison. Welcome back. Hey, thanks. Glad to be back. Um, after a two-week hiatus, um, yeah, just just excited to be back. A lot to a lot to break down. Obviously, missed probably the two most important weeks of the off season for the Steelers and the Pirates are ramping up, and a lot of things have changed and happened within those past two weeks that I've been gone. But glad to be back. Schedule's a lot calmer now after all this high school basketball and March Madness stuff is wrapped up. So can't wait to be back talking to Pittsburgh sports. Absolutely. The one, the only, the trusted sidearm, Nate Breisinger, is back as well. Hello, Nate. Hello, hello. Glad to have Ethan back. Ran into him a couple times over the last couple of weeks, so had a had a beg him to return to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I heard it wasn't easy, but I'm glad you were able to pull it off since I'm a little further away. Uh, but anyway, we'll jump right into it, and we're going to talk about these two first, but I'll preview the whole show for you just in case you don't care about them as much as I do, which there's no way you possibly could. Uh, they're basically my children. Uh, we're going to jump into the Pirates a little bit later on, talk about their starting rotation, some of the other guys who made the roster for opening day, talk about the Penguins. Jake Gensel is back in Pittsburgh. I'm pretty sure we all just watched the first period of that game, so we could see the uh, tribute video, see what happened there. I uh, was not expecting the cameo from Siri in that uh, tribute, but we'll get to that a little bit later. And then we'll talk a little bit about what I'd like to call the Steelers news dump from Justin Fields to the NFL making changes. Uh, we're hopefully going to touch on it all or as much of it as we possibly can without going way over our uh, time slot here. But anyway, uh, Nate and Ethan, two of my good friends, two people who work very hard for what they've earned in the uh, industry thus far. Uh, both of them got to cover March Madness over the weekend. As you know, they were in PPG Paints Arena for the first and uh, second round games, and they were right there in the thick of it. Got to see the legend of Oakland basketball and uh, some pretty other good games too. So whichever one of you wants to jump into it, just uh, talk about that experience and what it was like for you young whippersnappers to be there with the big dogs. Yeah, it was it was pretty sweet. Um, I think it was even better that I got to work alongside Ethan and Michael Deemer from Colonial Sports Network, and then Austin Bechtold and I were doing the double coverage for Pittsburgh Sports Now. But the Ethan and I were there in 2022, and these games this year exceeded that, those by far. I mean, those games back in 22 were just not – they did not live up to the hype. Sister Jean was – in town for those ones but um this this group was it was a bunch of fun games i mean three upsets on day one um plus a, a solid creighton team taking care of akron uh, but yeah we saw jack golke i mean what an unbelievable story i mean i got to see him with oakland at rmu um but he didn't put up the type of numbers he did in the tournament um when they were at the upmc event center so obviously such a awesome story and kind of um, defeated the purpose a little bit of Ethan's story because his guy that he was covering didn't put up the numbers that he wanted to. But all in all, I mean, great day one. Then the round of 32 was was spectacular. Both those games, overtime games, I mean, you couldn't ask for more in, in those matchups. Yeah, I think I think Saturday's matchups, as much as the upsets were thrilling and, and the way that they were done in Jack Olkey on, on Thursday, I think Saturday's games trumped – Thursday's games just because of just the, the the madness that ensued Saturday night. You you had two of two of the crowd favorites, the neutral crowd crowd favorites, uh, with DJ Burns Jr. and Jack Golke going at it at it in the first game of um, the final session on Saturday night. That game going to, into overtime, Golke hitting a number of uh, tough three point shots down the stretch. There made a four point three play to make things interesting. Um, NC State had had a chance to win the game late in late in the second half, got the final shot. So those games on Saturday were incredible, and yeah, like Nate said, Thursday's games. When we went to that first session of um, in 2022, those games were pretty much snooze fest. Ohio State ha handled Loyola Chicago pretty well, and and Delaware gave Villanova a fight for probably not even a half, 
and then uh, Nova pulled away in, in the later stages. But these games, just competitive, competitive, competitive. Even that Oregon-South Carolina game was competitive for the most part until Oregon pulled away, but that was even that upset there. Um, but, yeah, just to see the crowd into it and, you know, Pittsburgh getting a wrap of not – being a big basketball town, I think the neutral crowd was out in numbers there. And even um, the fans from each team uh, traveled well um, all across the board. Um, so it, it was very entertaining from an atmosphere perspective of it. And I, I think just from the media aspect of it, um, getting to see a lot of the guys that I, I uh, work alongside down at uh, PNC Park during the baseball season. They were there covering it for their respective outlets, being there with Nate, being able to share those moments with him, um, which is incredible to be um, alongside with him as well. Um, but yeah, just to take in everything. And um, obviously the, the the guy that I was covering in the angle that I was going for um, didn't really pan out the way that um, I would have liked in terms of a content perspective. Um, still was able to get a lot of Good things out of that Wednesday before those games kicked off. and um, Couldn't have asked for a, a, a better weekend. Lots of long nights um, involved with it, but couldn't ask for a better weekend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those games are fun to watch, too, as you both basically uh, said a few times there. But yeah, Nick, uh, did, you, wa did you watch any of those? The Pittsburgh games? Yeah. Pretty much all of them, yeah. What was What was your favorite one to watch? Who did Oregon play Saturday? Because that was in Pittsburgh, Crane. wasn't it? Crane. Yeah, Oregon was, Curtin was really overtime. good. Yeah. The second I... overtime was unfortunately a little lackluster, but that was a really mm. good game. The Kentucky game uh, against Oakland was obviously really exciting to watch too, but you could kind of really feel the energy coming across the TV, uh, just a really amped up arena, and it was fun. It was infectious. It was. I think obviously the storyline was Oakland and Golke, you know, with the upset and then going into the NC State game. But I had the the game coverage of the Oregon-Creighton game, and I just knew that that game was going to be a good one. I mean, both high-profile teams, Creighton out of the Big East, um, with some tremendous players in Baylor Shireman and, and Cockbrenner. But um, that was, yeah, that one was really, I think, came across as advertised. I thought that was a tremendous game. For sure. It's unfortunate now. RMU, our wonderful alma mater, her claim to fame was they beat Kentucky once at home. This is the NIT. But now Pittsburgh, there's an issue with Calipari coming back home, I guess, because now he lost to Oakland, but this was in the real deal, much bigger stage. I'm sure you're not going to be able to get the RME faithful to shut up about that game still, but got to damper it a little bit. Calipari's not going to be able to, to ever play back in Pittsburgh. I, I think that's just an omen right there after – after losing to Oakland the way that they did, and he just got outclassed, outcoached. Mm -hmm. uh, just like defensively, the, the assignment there, there were assignments missed. Just they were out of sorts. Yeah, he can say that his team's young, but you're Kentucky. You have some of the best high school recruits in the country. You have a guy that's a fifth year that's only played Division II basketball up until this year. You had a guy in Trey Townsend that was a walk on at Oakland for his first season before getting a scholarship, coming in playing the way that he did on Thursday. Like Calipari just got outclassed and he's returning as Kentucky's coach next year. It was reported today, but you know, if you're Calipari, I wouldn't take a game against Pitt. I wouldn't take a game against hell. I wouldn't take a game against RMU um, or Duquesne for that matter back here in Pittsburgh. I just wouldn't even want to show your face unless you're coming back home to, to visit and sightsee because playing basketball, college basketball here in Pittsburgh is just bad. Bad, bad for Calipari. Got to wonder if he will come back to Pittsburgh ever as a coach. I don't think the odds of that are very good. He's got to get the chills down his spine when uh, when that happens. But unfortunately, they're not going to buy him out for the 30-some-odd million dollars that I think it was. But yeah, really fun weekend. And uh, Rob Rossi, of all people, tweeting about how good of a college basketball town Pittsburgh is and Anyone who's had the pleasure of meeting me has known that I've always said we need a tournament of Pitt, Duquesne, RMU, and a revolving fourth. Now, he took that idea and ran with it a bit more. He kind of kept it as Pitt plays Duquesne one night, then they play Penn State or WVU the next night. RMU plays St. Francis, Duquesne. Duquesne plays Pitt, RMU, and then whatever the extra teams do, they do. But 
Uh, hopefully that actually might get some traction now because this town loves their college basketball, and I think that was evident uh, this weekend. So that would be great to see some of these quote-unquote city schools, area schools coming together and uh, getting some butts in seats there at PPG. All right, then. I guess there's no further thoughts on that, so we'll just move right along then. Uh, Ethan, I was really thinking I was going to giggle like a little schoolgirl a little more and talk about how excited he is, but I guess he's done bragging for now. Just kidding. Uh, but anyway, Ethan, if you click in the private chat on this uh, stream, I got an ad read for you to do. So why okay. don't you do it right now? Oh, geez. And, and, uh, uh, we're going to have to edit this out because I'm not seeing it. You're not seeing it? Here, let I'm me not I don't see it, see it either. Chat. Nope. Let me. Let let me. You don't have a private chat, or like you don't. See no, the I have. Tab? I have a. I have a private okay. chat. Oh, there, there, it is. There, there it is. There it is. There it is. Just read that. Don't practice. Just start reading it. Hey everyone, Ethan Morrison here, telling you to check out the newly launched Stranded Sports Store. We have shirts, stickers, and even exclusive Stranded and Pittsburgh merch, so you can rep your favorite show on a daily basis. We even have a Stranded Sports Open collection with proceeds benefiting Make a Wish. Buy one two, or even three shirts if you are feeling crazy. Click the link in our bio for more. I'm Ethan Morrison, and I love, love, love a nice T-shirt, cuddles, and a cup of joe. Thank you, Ethan. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was incredible. You should get paid to do that. You should work at Falcone Automotive. But anyway, I can't believe I made you do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pirates announced their opening day roster. Uh, I don't know if... It would be fair to say there were many surprises given some of the injuries and stuff that they've been dealing with, but uh, a lot of people talking about the rotation and I'll give my two cents anyway in a few moments here, but we'll start it off with just uh, Ethan Morrison. We'll let him keep talking, I guess. Why not? He's already fired up. I mean, you could hear it. You could hear it in his voice just a few moments ago. Uh, but yeah, Pirates, uh, Jared Jones, Bailey Falter getting those last two spots in the open rotations. Uh, Ethan, what do you make of that? Um, I, I don't necessarily get the falter um, move there. He struggled mightily in his last um, couple of starts in Pittsburgh as, as someone in the rotation. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how he responds this year, getting that uh, fourth spot, fourth spot in the rotation. I believe we're in, the, in that last spot in the rotation. Uh, Jared Jones was kind of surprised with that move. Um, not something the Pirates normally do, starting a guy – um, starting a guy that's a rookie uh, with the big league club, getting his first, uh, making his major league debut in just the third game of the season in Miami on Saturday. I definitely be glued uh, to the TV and watching that one just to see how he does. Cause he's had a phenomenal spring um, over these past couple of weeks. And he really proved that he was able to be on this bigger league roster and break camp with the big league club. So, very interested to see how he does um, now with the Pirates in the in a big league environment in the regular season. Um, there, also Henry Davis proving himself to start with the big league club. There was a lot of noise saying that he would start the year in AAA and how all of that would pan out. He proved himself that he could handle the bat well, especially after his injury at the end of last year that kind of sidelined him. The bat was 50-50 defensively as a catcher um, was nowhere near where the Pirates wanted him to be. He worked his butt off throughout the entire off season, worked with Paul Skeens, worked with other guys at Bradenton in Pirate City throughout the off season to get ready. Um, caught a good bit during the, th during the spring training over these past, over the past month. Um, so he's, re he's ready. He's there now. If he can handle the bat well, I think he's going to fit well fit very well into the starting lineup for the pirates. And he's, he's a bat that they need very, very much. So um, moving forward and they need that bat to be strong um, outside of the opening day roster. I think Paul Skeen starting a triple a with only six and a half innings of professional um, pitching experience is, is a good sign. Um, obviously wasn't going to break the uh, break camp with the big league club. Uh, I, there was no chance in hell that, that he was going to do that uh, with his lack of experience there. A lot of fans wanted it, um, but make him check some more boxes, get him those reps down in AAA. There's guys, it's not like it's double A where there's not a lot of guys that have prior big league experience. You're in AAA, you're seeing guys that are up and down throughout the minor leagues. 
playing more big league ball, getting set down, doing rehab assignments, this, that, and the other. So it's going to be a good litmus test for Skeens um, in these early parts of the season. I see him, say, these first one to two months in AAA. If he can prove that he's ready to go, I, I don't see why you don't bring him up, at least at the end of May, at the latest early June, um, if he's pitching well. Um, you, you just can't keep him down for that long. Um, but yeah, it, it should be an exciting one. Obviously, the Pirates, I think they look a lot better than they did um, a year ago today from where they were entering into the season, where they went off onto that big hot streak in the beginning of April. Um, I don't see them getting off to that hot streak and then plateauing like they did um, during last season. But they are definitely in a much better spot. They have definitely more pieces to build around that they have built around and that they want to move forward with. Uh, the bullpen is a area of concern for me. A lot of injuries that have uh, dealt Dory Moretta. He'll be out for an extended period of time. Um, David Bednar dealt with some injuries in the early part of spring training. He should be good to go um, by Thursday when the Pirates start. Ooh, I just hit my mic. I'm that excited. Uh, <laughs> Roddy when the Pirates. It. When the when the pirates um, Holy crap. start their season in Miami, he should be good. He should be He's good to go. Um, he should be good to go. But that bullpen, everyone was asking, why are the pirates adding so much to this bullpen? Why are, why is this bullpen? Why does this bullpen have so many pieces? And this is exactly why. You're already seeing the injuries kind of take take over this bullpen from what was very very strong to now. It's still a. I, I still think it's a, still a solid bullpen, but you are definitely losing some of those main pieces. You still got Carmen Majinski, who I think is still going to be a very, very solid piece, um, a, a lesser known guy out of that out of that bullpen, but I still think can um, play very well. Colin Holderman will start on the 15 day IL. He got hit with the vi the virus that was swirling around the uh, the uh, Pirates camp throughout spring training that sideline a lot of guys. Um, so he'll be missing for the first um, two weeks or so throughout the beginning of the season. He'll need to get ramped back up before um, before he can get back ready to go um, for his start to the season. But overall, um, yeah, that, that, that's my thoughts. I, I think it's a, a very, very solid opening day roster for the Pirates. Yeah, the uh, Bailey Falter thing made little to no sense of me. Here we had a guy who has an ERA of almost eight. Opponents are hitting almost 320 off of him. He went 0 2, six homers. You don't need me to tell you that's not good. Um, am I the biggest fan of Ortiz? No, but he did significantly better this spring. His ERA was under 3 5. Uh, no real big blow up games that I can recall. Uh, 229 opponent batting average. I would have slid Ortiz in there over Falter. Uh, it sounds like Shelton was just like, oh, yeah, I really wanted a lefty, uh, which is great reasoning, I guess. Uh, so congrats to Bailey Falter. Interested to see how long he lasts with uh, the myriad of guys they have that could compete with him. But Jared Jones, hats off to him, man. Number three prospect, 22 years old. No earned runs throughout the spring. Uh, opponents hit, what, one? Uh, I can't think of what they hit off him. I didn't write it down either, so I can't cheat. But I mean, he really had no blow up games either. Uh, the Red Sox game, he kind of skated around. He walked four guys and gave up, I think, four hits too, but he ended up no damage. They gave up a run, but it wasn't earned. Uh, so Jared Jones did everything he could to make that roster. And by some miracle, the Pirates actually said, All right, let's ride the hot hand and put him in our opening day lineup. Uh, so that was great to see. Uh, so Contreras, Ortiz, and Fleming all going to be coming out of the bullpen. Uh, when Bailey falter starts to falter, uh, they'll probably turn to one of them. And I hope it's not Contreras. Uh, he was one of my biggest disappointments of the spring. I really wanted him to come back with a bit of a vengeance and I think he had a decent, no, actually, I don't think he did. I think he started off uh, cold and kind of stuck around there. Uh, excuse me. I'm thinking of Quinn Priester who didn't do too bad. I mean, his numbers aren't incredibly flashy. He had a five, eight, seven ERA, but aside from a game against the Phillies where he gave up five runs, four of which came in, uh, way of a grand slam. He didn't really have any outright bad performances. He gave up three runs in his last outing in the spring. He gave up no earned twice, gave up one earned twice. I get if they want to take their time with him, okay, but I thought Quinn Priester made a pretty compelling case for himself. 
Uh, again, much better than Bailey Falter, but I'm not here to sit here and make this the anti Bailey uh, Falter power hour. So uh, I'll move on to something else. Great to see Davis made the team. As you said, Ethan, he really got serious here and showed a lot of promise. Uh, Triolo made the roster. Sounds like he's going to be the starting second baseman. That was kind of a surprise. I think the Pagaro hype train was pretty strong heading into the spring. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got. A quick little uh, thought dump there. Uh, Michael A. Taylor made the team to the surprise of no one. That's nice. They got a starting outfielder that late into the spring training, but it's nice to see they got another solid piece uh, in that outfield to go with Sawinski and Reynolds, and now they got some depth guys they can plug in place in uh, in other spots. I, I think when yeah. you look at – oh, sorry, Nate. Um, I, I, I think – yeah, the, the one thing that I want I want to add that I forgot to touch on is Pagaro not breaking camp with the club, uh, with Shelton and Sherrington going for Alika Williams, who didn't really play that well and didn't really jump off the chart as a guy. Obviously, you're looking at Jerry Shriola, who had an incredible spring, an incredible defender, and for him to switch from third base, where you have a basically a platinum glove guy in Key Brian Hayes. To now switch over to second base, which is a completely different feeling. Um, he's not even he's not even sticking around at first, but for Triola to take that second or that second base starting job from Baguero and Alika Williams, um it is just a testament to how hard he has worked and, and the bat that he has. I mean, he can hit the ball um pretty well as well. He's shown some flashes that he can handle the bat um as well. Uh, but Alika Williams over Pagaro. I, I don't I don't know. I, I would have rather seen Pagaro, especially with all of um all of what you wanted to get out of him out of that Jameson Tayo trade. Um and just the, the, the piece that he was and in, in, in the player that he was, especially as a shortstop, um, just to not see him with the big league club um early on is a surprise to me. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how that all pans out with him over the course of the first. A uh, couple months of the season, what happens with him, um, how they go about, especially with how um, Williams plays as that backup guy. But, um, yeah, just a very um, puzzling, puzzling last piece to the roster for me. Yeah, I'll carry on from that point. Um, yeah, I'm not too thrilled that Alika Williams is on that starting roster. Um, I understand you have to have – a strong defensive player, maybe over a bat at certain times. Um, but obviously he doesn't really do much at the plate, uh, but he doesn't have to start at, as of right now because Cruz obviously back this season and Jared Triolo taking that second base role, which I really was impressed with Triolo last year, batting 298 to close out the season. Um, I like that Davis is in there. Obviously there's a reasoning behind that with Grandal injured as of now but the other thing is Michael A. Taylor nice addition to the outfield but I really wish Josh Palacios would have had a better spring he had zero hits and 12 at bats um, obviously down in AAA to start the year um, wish he would have played a little bit better because I liked his game last year I thought he could have been a solid reserve or a starter until they brought in Taylor um, but then switching gears to the pitching side of things, what was supposed to be a big strength for the, the Pirates this year, that bullpen hit with some of those injuries. It's going to be, you know, we're going to see how they start off the year. It's going to be very testing to them to see where they start. And then the starting rotation, I think we all knew coming into spring that that fourth and fifth role was going to be wide, wide open. And Jared Jones came in and stole that fourth spot away um, with an exceptional spring. Um, and it's good. I, I like this influx of young talent. And that's obviously what the pirates are going to be carried upon this year outside of some of those veterans like McCutcheon and others. But I mean, it's really going to be Keller. We're going to see what Jared Jones does in the starting rotation. Now, obviously Gonzalez and Perez picked up in the off season, but the pirates never went out and got a big time starting pitcher. So they needed someone to step up. Jones did. And then that fifth spot is still wide open. Obviously Bailey falter in there now, but anybody could come in there. You know, in, in three weeks, we don't even know Falter still going to be in that starting rotation. We'll see how he starts. Ortiz could slide in there. Maybe Quinn Priester starts off well down in the minors and, and bumps back up. But 
I think there's there's a lot of promise to this Pirates team. Still some questionable spots. Again, the rotation, we'll see. I mean, Jones had a great spring, but who knows? Who knows if it translates? I mean, he's still super young, 22 years old. Um, so we'll see how everything unfolds. Get your get your tickets, Pirates fans. Jared Jones is um, lined up to start on for the home opener against the O's. So yes. um, if, if you want to see that, that young guy um, – pitch in person um i mean I, it, it should be a great series nonetheless with two of the youngest teams in baseball going at it with the with the squad that the orioles has in the in the pirates young young guns as well but um yeah should be a very entertaining one absolutely i heard ethan bought us all tickets for the first baseline well actually yeah. that's the visitor side so the third baseline sorry third baseline yeah i ruined my own yep. joke anyway a lot of questions still need to be answered but uh I'm impressed. I think they did a lot of the right things, as I kind of said, as we led into this uh, with the roster. One big question mark is one of their newest acquisitions. That is Domingo Herman, uh, someone who was linked to the Pirates all offseason long. They finally brought him in. Uh, not on the opening day roster. Uh, is he hurt, Ethan? No, I, I, no. I think okay. – No, I don't. I don't believe he's hurt. I think they were – Trying to get him um, past some things in mm -hmm. terms of he needed to prove himself before um, getting a chance to uh, pitch, I think, anywhere in the organization. Mm -hmm. And before he got that shot to really prove himself as a player, he needed to prove himself as a person before that. Obviously, um, some things came out about that over the weekend from, I think, NJ.com. Yeah. Um, or yeah, over the, over the past couple of days, I don't know, Nick, if you want to get into that. Yeah. I didn't think he was hurt. I just want to make sure re you know, reading up on everyone, I kind of got some things crossed there on who was hurt and who they just weren't giving chances to and whatnot. But yeah, I don't know if it originated from the New York post 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 or what publication it actually originated from, but basically they talked to Domingo about an incident in the Yankee clubhouse where some things were smashed uh, he allegedly was drunk or had been drinking, which he vehemently denies in this article. He said he drank the night before, didn't have any drinks day of. Uh, it's an interesting piece, to put it lightly. Uh, he basically says he doesn't have a drinking problem. And when I say basically, I mean he said he doesn't have a drinking problem. And I quote, I drink when I want to drink, but I don't have any problem, uh, which is interesting when you got a guy that your favorite team a team you cover ethan uh when they give him kind of a prove yourself kind of deal and you can be one of the pieces to our puzzle a guy who's already been suspended for some other horrendous allegations uh yeah not what you want to hear from him in terms of hey we need to see some growth before we give you a chance uh a quote like that a piece like this coming out where it seems like he doesn't have that ability to look in the mirror and say oh boy maybe i need to make some changes uh, yeah, this was already a signing that was a little odd to me. Uh, you know, I don't want to sit here and act like once you do something bad, that means you're a bad influence permanently, but you've already got some, let's just say a little controversy, uh, controversy in that clubhouse already in the names of Chapman and some others. Uh, so bringing him on this late into the mix was a little interesting to me with all the young players there and if you want to bring in veterans, feel like you want them to be positive influences and you know they're going to be positive influences, not guys on a, hey, prove to us that you're a better person than you were a few years ago. Uh, so that acquisition was weird to me, and this article didn't do anything to uh, calm my concerns or quench the fears I had. Not anything that he did is, 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 is I guess, laughable or humorous, but this, this in and of itself... That quote from him is laughable. Look, you had your shot to turn, basically turn your career around. You're one year removed, not even, I, I don't even think a year removed from throwing a perfect game in Major League Baseball before you went down that deep spiral um, with the alcohol abuse and then got released from the Yankees. You're less than a year removed. You're, you're still a decent pitcher, but the character issues with him is just and, – and that quote is just laughable. You have your shot to turn your life around. You're getting your second chance with at, at a time in baseball where there's 
so many different issues revolving around different guys with these types of same issues, domestic abuse, um, and, and now and now alcoholism with Armand now, along with the domestic abuse issues. So there's so many things revolving around there. There's there was a lot of noise with this signing from not only the fan base but even the front office as well, doing their due diligence with this before they made the signing. And then for him to come out and say, I drink when I want to drink and I don't have an issue. That just, I, I, he should be, he should be released right away. Cause that just shows that he's not, he's not changed as a person. He's not shown to you that he's improved at, with his decision makings and, and the t- decisions that he makes as a human being off the field, let alone um, his decisions that he makes on the field. And he's just a bad influence in general to a clubhouse where you need that veteran leadership from veteran guy, from veteran guys in a year where the pirates are looking to make big strides forward and potentially sneak into a playoff spot. If you're Domingo Hermon, that's the last thing I would want to say. And that's the last, and I that's the last thing that I would want to do is what he did right there, and it's just a whole mess of a situation, and not something that you want to look at, especially days before opening day, and say, oh man, this guy has not changed, and even after that signing two weeks ago, he hasn't changed one bit. So just overall, it's just a it's a terrible situation. Yeah, very controversial to bring him on in general. Um, and this, as we both kind of touched on this does him no favors. I, I don't know what the point of keeping him would be at this stage. And I know the rotations a concern you and Nate brought up and it's a concern I have as well, but I mean, they've got these homegrown guys, give them a chance. You know, I know he's done well. I mean, he had a perfect game for crying out loud, but he's 31. He needs to have a nice little redemption arc, both on the field and as a person, it's not worth it for this team to have something like that going on. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just not worth it. But now we're going to move on to something a little more lighthearted. That is our record predictions for the Pittsburgh Pirates this season. We'll go right across the row. We're going to start with Yinzer himself, Nate Breisinger. Well, if everything goes right, I'm going a little high on the Pirates this year. I'm going with a 10 win improvement and the Pirates finishing 86 and 76. So pretty lofty goal for this Buckeyes squad, but in what should be a rather even NL central division, um, the Pirates should compete pretty well. And I think Nick, we had talked about this probably two weeks ago in our last episode with the Pirates lineup. This is a season where you don't really have to rely on one singular guy or two, sing- two guys in the batting order. Now you have four or five guys with Cruz back and Davis, the way he's been batting, that should be able to hit the ball around. And I think hitting is going to be a strength this year. Pitching, obviously, we'll see what happens with the starting rotation and the bullpen. But 86 and 76, and they potentially could sneak into a wild card spot because obviously if you look at last year's wild cards, um, Arizona and Miami both finishing with 84 wins. So it's a possibility that the Pirates sneak into the postseason this year. Mm -hmm. Ethan for me I I see them getting up to above 500 uh, for the first time I think since when was it oh boy 2018 when they won 81 and 81 I got them 82 and 80 this year Um, still an improvement from last year Um, like I said I don't think they get off to as hard of the start as they did in April that really helped pad their win total in the beginning parts of the season but I see them being more consistent than they were last year. Obviously, like Nate said, they have a, more of a consistent um, lineup if all holds in terms of uh, keeping injuries at bay. They have a more consistent lineup, uh, a, a a lineup that can hit the ball and hit the ball well. Uh, so I do see them making an improvement there with Skeens on the wings and making his major league debut later in the year. You're adding more to that rotation that it already had uh, to begin the year. Now you got Jared Jones, you got some young pieces that um, need to prove that they can pitch well at the big league level. 
Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see there. But, yeah, I, I see them making an improvement. And, yeah, as Nate said, this NL Central is wide open. So I see them really playing some meaning, meaningful baseball down the stretch here um, in the later stage of the season that we haven't seen in years and years and years. Um, so for this Pirates team, I think um, as long as they can keep the injuries to a minimum and, and really supplement those injuries with some um, – solid play. If they do arise, I, I think they're going to find a lot of success this year, um, especially with this division being so wide open once again. Mm -hmm. As you said, Ethan, that win total last year wasn't totally reflective of how good they were because they had April, which was a huge uh, take it in stride kind of month where the numbers kind of got fluffed a bit. But this is a team that excites me. This is the most excited I've been for a pirate team in quite some time the young guns are all up already or they're close to being brought up uh, relatively early into the season. Uh, and then, of course, the concern that you've both brought up numerous times, and I'll bring it up once again because why not, uh, this rotation and this bullpen kind of scare me, but I think there's going to be a lot of moving around. Uh, you know, how really good are their top-end pitchers this year? Spring training, I didn't see exactly what I wanted to see out of some of those guys in that starting rotation. Can they get replaced if they start to fall off? We'll see. And that led me to have some doubts about their record. But then around midway through the day, I had an intervention. I had some thoughts. That energy in PNC is going to be infectious. We saw it in April of last year. Now imagine that with O'Neill Cruz smacking some home runs. Imagine that when Paul Skeens gets called up in June, maybe early July. Imagine that when Kutch hits 300 at the PNC Park home opener this year when he hits his 300th career home run. The Pirates are not a winning ball team. They're not a team that's playing to get over 500. They're a team who's playing for a wild card spot this year. And all I got to say is this. Root, root, root for our home team, a new Pirate generation, everybody shout. I'm not going to play that any longer. I don't know if they're going to copyright strike us, but damn it, you better be excited to get on the North Shore, drink a $12 Miller Lite, eat some $15 chicken nuggets, and you better have a damn good time at the ball game this summer because I think the Buckos are for real. I really do. And now we're going to move on to a team who has... That is the Pittsburgh Penguins. Nathaniel, sorry for calling you that. I regretted that immediately. Jake Gensel's home tonight back in Pittsburgh. They blew a horrendous, or I guess they blew a big lead against the Avalanche. It was horrendous hockey. What the hell? What are we even doing anymore? Yeah, it's it's been a disastrous month of March, and this is usually the time of year where we're, we're keeping a close eye on the Penguins. You're getting ready for that playoff push. They're in a playoff positioning, and this year, complete opposite. It's it's finally time that, you know, the Penguins are pretty much done. I mean, they're 3-8-2 and two in the month of March, and it's capped by some awful losses. You go back to the beginning of the month with Calgary, just a terrible, you know, come-from-behind loss where the Flames scored a couple of late goals, a couple of turnovers, but yeah. You're up 4 nothing against the Avalanche. Obviously a solid team that can score pretty quickly. But, man, that was that was an ugly loss. And that's just, again, how this month and how the season has, has gone. But, yeah, as you mentioned, Jake Gensel's back. And as we're recording right now, 1-1, one -one, uh, Jesse Pugliarvi scored for the Pens. And then Dimitri Roerlov tied it up for the Canes. But the, the Hurricanes, a very, very solid team this year, could make a, a really deep run. and. The addition of Jake Gensel has been huge for them um, in eight games. He has two goals, 12 points, but the biggest thing is he's a plus 11. He doesn't get – they don't get scored on when he's on the ice. Um, he's been a huge addition for the Canes, and obviously tonight had to have been an emotional night at the rink. I, I didn't get a chance to catch the, um, the video, but, I mean, obviously a guy that's been in this organization for the last – seven seasons, eight seasons. I mean, that's that's tough to watch him come home. Very similar to 
you know, probably the last person we've seen come home like that, Mark Andre Fleury, where that's a really meaningful player that's sort of homegrown, um, franchise grown player. I mean, obviously, you have your Phil Kessels and your other players that have come back home, but nothing to the extent of Jake Gensel and what he's truly meant to this Pittsburgh team. Cause I mean, he, the Penguins might have not have been or have gone to where they did in 2016, 2017 against the Preds without him because. As a rookie, he came up and tore through that playoffs and put up some substantial numbers. I know there was, um, you, know, you talk about some of the greatest moments of Gensel's career in Pittsburgh, and the one that sticks out to me is, don't ask, I think it's game one or game two against the Preds where they hadn't had a shot on goal in like, what, like 40 plus minutes. And he goes, or maybe not that long, um, and he goes and the first shot the Penguins had in quite some time in that game, they score and then they go on to win that game. I mean, just how much he's truly impacted this team, you know, it's hard to put into words for the Penguins fans. And I'm sure tonight was uh, an emotional evening down at PPG Paints Arena, obviously still a game on hand. And if you're the Penguins, you're in kind of a a tough situation because obviously you don't want to keep going on the slide. But at the same time, you're sneaking into where you could potentially be fighting for that lottery pick and number one right now, which is crazy to think about. Because I know with the Blackhawks, that was a huge deal when they landed the first overall pick to get Connor Bedard, similar to the San Antonio Spurs getting Wembenyama with the first overall picks. Two franchises that have been so good for so long, dynasty franchises. They have two bad years. They get the first overall pick, and now they have another franchise player. And the Penguins could be very much in the mix again, which would be absolutely crazy. But yeah, big night in Pittsburgh to see Gensel back. It's a little – I saw a picture, I think it was um, someone from the Trib posted out of a Hurricanes fan wearing a Gensel jersey, a, a, a Hurricanes jersey, and it uh, looked really weird. It did. It did. Oh, man. That was emotional, that video. Even the Siri voice couldn't ruin it for me. Uh, that was an artistic choice, though, using uh, using the Siri voice. But yeah, Pittsburgh uh, might be in contention for that lottery pick. They've rigged it for them before. Why not think they might do it again? They handed it to Chicago so they could get Bedard. I'm pretty excited about them being in the lottery. I think they're going to get it. Uh, Penguins got the Yager bobbleheads back as well, thank God. And it was a national emergency. Uh, But yeah, it sounds like those are going to get sent out next week. Still not totally convinced that wasn't a PR stunt. I know it'd kind of be stupid to screw fans out of getting bobbleheads and whatnot that night. Uh, but I don't know. Something seemed kind of fishy about that, but they found them in California. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in this state of mind to be giving uh, conspiracy theories that are well thought out right now. But I don't know. Something about that ain't sitting right with me, and I hate when people say that, but uh, that's how I feel right now. But anyway, uh, Nate, anything else here before we move on to the Steelers? No, i just say this. The last couple of weeks of the Penguin season is going to be really difficult um, I mean, I don't even know how many more, how many people are even watching at this point. Um, so yeah, very interesting off season ahead for the Pens. Penguins Hawk is always brought to you by purehockey.com. You can find out more through the link in the description, NHL apparel, hockey gear, whatever you need in the world of hockey, pure hockey's got it for you. And now we move on to the Steelers. Oh my, they've signed Justin Fields. Since we last talked, they've done a bunch of stuff. And I wish there was a more articulate way for me to say that. They've signed people. They brought in Kyle Allen at quarterback. They've brought in some interesting receiver choices in Van Jefferson and Quez Watkins. And today, the NFL announced they're going to adopt the old XFL kickoff format. And what did the con artist do? He went out and signed Cordero Patterson. He can return. He can receive. He can rush. And now he's a Steeler, back with his good friend, I'm assuming, Arthur Smith. So this is just the latest on what's been a pretty strong offseason for the Steelers, kind of getting that Swiss Army Knife kind of guy in the lineup, as uh, Patterson is, going to hopefully enhance their special teams game now with this new uh, kickoff. So uh, I'm going to open the floor up. I know we've kind of run a little long, so we'll try to keep this somewhat short. But uh, as a matter of fact, I even have to go get on the phone with my lawyer. My interpreter was using money to bet on DraftKings. Uh, but Nate, uh, what did you want to uh, touch on from this last few weeks here in uh, the Steelers offseason? 
Well, you obviously bolster your quarterback room. The complete overhaul that the Steelers have gone through after Rudolph and Trubisky signing elsewhere and then trading Kenny Pickett because he was, you know, a little unpleased with the signing of Russell Wilson. Um, But I think the Justin Fields move was highly talked about, and then the rumors were pushed aside, and then all of a sudden he's on the Pittsburgh Steelers, which Mike Tomlin has – preached highly of Justin Fields the last couple of days um, at their offseason meetings. Um, talked about him oozing of talent, which I, I've seen a lot of people have said not many coaches have talked about their backup quarterback like that. So, I mean, he's definitely a guy that can be a little bit of a project but can start once Russell Wilson is gone. Um, but the other thing I think that I just wanted to touch on just briefly was – the, the wide receiver signings really haven't moved the needle much, obviously. I mean, Van Jefferson, Quez Watkins, those aren't guys that are just going to, you know, make your wide receiver room the most explosive in the entire NFL. Obviously, they're decent additions, and we don't we won't know until we see them. And again, we've talked about where this offense with Arthur Smith is going to be pretty balanced with the use of tight ends and, and Friar Muth and the running game picked up steam heavily over last last season. Um, but with George Pickens as your number one, and then you have Van Jefferson, Austin, Quez Watkins, and if you want to throw Patterson out there um, at moments, it, it, it's nothing compared to what we saw just a few years ago and the talent that they did have that maybe they'd never used with Claypool and Juju and you know all those guys and Deontay Johnson. But I don't know. This receiver room is going to be – a very, very interesting talking point for the next um, couple of months. I, I, I think, I think Khan still has one more, one more trick up his sleeve in terms of getting that receiver that they need to supplement um, George Pickens uh, there. I, I think there's just one more move, but yeah, there, I mean, there's not much more to add on onto the fields and Wilson um, chatter, but just the unorthodox move that, Omar Khan moves that he Omar Khan is making. This is unheard of for the Steelers to make this many moves to have this exciting of an off season in free agency. And then to be able to make a trade like you did for Justin Fields, it, it's just unheard of. So this is what you need to do in this day and age in the NFL, the old, the old Rooney tricks and the old Kevin Colbert tricks. And I think Kevin Colbert was a damn good GM. That's but, an RMU alum too. You watch your mouth. There you go. And I'm not going to bad talk Kevin Colbert. But in this day and age, you need to, to find some some flash, some flash flashiness in the way that you go about your business in free agency and make trades. And the Steelers have done none of that. They draft and they develop. They, and they, for the most part, they develop fair, fairly well. I, I think we can say that. Maybe with the way you know, over the past couple of years, maybe I mean in the terms of the way that they develop their wide receivers, I, I think you can say that. But I, I think they need those guys with NFL experience. They've done that with Fields. They've done that with Wilson. They need two guys, two veteran guys in there that Tomlin likes, and Tomlin knows that they will want to be here and they will buy into his preachings and his his quick one-liners and witted responses. Um, I think that those two guys are going to buy in really, really well. Um, and just something, yeah, like I said, unorthodox things that the Steelers are doing, and and I'm all here for it. It's made for one exciting off season, and I, I just can't wait to see all of these guys in action. I don't like stomping on someone's grave, but I'm really glad Kenny Pickett said, you know what? This is Bull crap. I thought I was the guy. Why'd you bring in Russell Wilson? This isn't fair. I don't want to have to compete against Russell Wilson. If I'm going to have to compete with someone, it's going to be for the Eagles, the team I like. So I can go compete against Jalen Hurts, but at least I'll be in Philadelphia. Yeah. Good luck with that. Good luck with that, Kenny. Good luck with that. Um, I'm sure, sure Kenny's a nice guy. Sure he is, but... I don't know what he thought he was entitled to uh, getting more chances. And I know this situation wasn't great for him. He had Matt Canada. His line definitely needed some work. 
And I know he didn't turn the ball over a lot, but when you're throwing it behind the line of scrimmage into the flat every single play, I would hope you don't throw it to the other team that often. Uh, but anyway, good luck to Kenny Pickett. Um, if Jalen Hurts goes out this year for any reason or the Eagles start the year 16-0 and and they just want to rest their starters, I'm really excited to see what happens because by some grace of God, I just know that Philadelphia is going to make him look like the second coming. Uh, see, it's Easter week too. See what I'm doing there? Uh, of Christ. But you know what? We'll see what happens. We will see what happens with old Kenneth. Uh, thanks. Thanks for beating the Raiders on the anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. That was very nice. And I'll never like you more than I did that day, Ken. And that's all I have to say uh, about that. Steelers country, let's ride. It's time for the last call. Brought to you by Rogue Energy. Throw your coffee, throw your apple juice. Ethan, throw your high C out the window. Rogue Energy is going to get you the energy you need to get through your day. We keep start with Nate. So now I'm going to start with Ethan. Last call. Let's see what you have to say. Well, with March Madness, the regional site in Pittsburgh, uh, for the first, the sub regional sites in Pittsburgh, uh, did I steal it again from you, Nick? No, I was reacting because Nate was reacting. I was trying to show him that no. I care about him and wanted to share in his upsetness. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So with, the first and second rounds wrapping up in Pittsburgh. All you got to say is NCAA, let's bring a regional final to the city of Pittsburgh. My goodness. The attendance that came out for those games over the course of those two days and the times that those games were at. Oh my gosh. They sold out. Now they, they sold out the two sessions on Thursday and then sold it out again. Saturday night, the late games on Saturday night still had the late games on Thursday and Saturday still had great attendance. And it shows that Pittsburgh really cares about basketball when it matters. You don't think of Pittsburgh, this blue collar town that has their football teams, the Pittsburgh Stillis and the Pittsburgh Pirates. They, they don't think, Oh, and the Penguins, Oh yeah. Basketball. Basketball team won't, won't won't succeed here, but no. Those fans came out. The neutral fans from Pittsburgh came out and put on one heck of an atmosphere in Pittsburgh, which begs the question, I think it's time for Pittsburgh to host a regional final in March Madness, host the Sweet 16, host the Elite Eight on the road to the Final Four. Pittsburgh's shown it. If you bring... Great teams and a great slate of games like you saw on Thursday and Saturday of this past week. They're going to come out. They're going to support. They're going to give you one hell of an atmosphere. So I think it's time to bring the second weekend of March Madness to the city of Pittsburgh. Well, Ethan, I, I obviously agree with you with how good the atmosphere was there. But we don't do it often, but I have a rebuttal to Ethan's case. I just don't think that'll ever happen. I just don't think Pittsburgh is suited to bring in regional games at least for the next decade because, first of all, the Fifth Avenue corridor is terrible. They need to fix that up, and it's obviously there's plans on doing so, but look at the, the teams, look at the cities that get the regional semis this year. Boston, L.A., Detroit, Dallas. Bigger cities with bigger arenas that's the big thing is obviously you can pack 18,500 in there but some of those cities your Phillies your Boston your Miami wherever else in the future or in the past that they've had it they're going to continue to do so it's just the same thing as the Steelers hosting the Super Bowl it's just not really going to happen in my opinion anyways I'll move on to my last call Sticking with March Madness, but a different perspective, um, different topic with, and it's sort of a double-edged sword, at least a double-edged sword in terms of my response and comments on this. And it's about the ACC getting the skepticism that they've had. Only a five-bid league this year. Um, first of all, I feel that, yes, the ACC has been a little undervalued. I think the Big 12 
you know, considered a power conference this year and hasn't done as well in the tournament with, you know, Texas Tech losing to an ACC team, Baylor losing to an ACC team. Obviously, ACC has taken care of some of those teams outside of Virginia's awful performance in the first four in. So I do think ACC was slighted. I think Pitt had a great case to be in, at least over Virginia, um, and some other some of those other teams. Um, and then Wake Forest also had a case. But the other half of this answer is, obviously the ACC is doing well right now with another four teams in the Sweet 16, and they've done that pretty regularly. Obviously a couple of national championships as well to go with that in the, in the past decade. What has that mic ever done to you? Or you've walloped <laughs> it like four times hey, tonight. hey. Hey, it fell. It fell over. It fell over. You drinking some high noons over there while you're talking no, with us? Jeez. Absolutely, absolutely not. I got a migraine. Have lost track of thought eight times this episode, and I still haven't walloped my mic with the right hand. Jesus. But the point that I wanted to bring up is, I need the people to quit complaining about the ACC. It's a done deal with who is in the tournament. The teams that are in the tournament are making the most of it because they're good teams. North Carolina and Duke should be in the Sweet 16 regardless. Obviously, Clemson's a nice surprise. Not really. I mean, they're a six seed. We've seen Syracuse be an 11 seed multiple times and get into the Elite Eight. But then NC State is the nice surprise. Obviously, they've been rolling since the ACC tournament. But I just need people to quit complaining about it. It's it's a done deal. Obviously, there can be whatever you want to say to the bracketologist leading into the tournament and keeping certain teams out. But guess what? 68 teams make the tournament. A certain load of that goes to the automatic qualifier. And then only a certain amount of teams can make it in after that. There's teams, plenty of other teams from other conferences that didn't make it, that could have made it. Your Seton Halls or your St. John's or whatever have you. I just wish people would just let it go. This tournament's been tremendous so far. Just let it be. It's one of the best postseasons in all of sports, from top to bottom, from professional to amateur. Just let it go. Enjoy the tournament. The ACC is doing fine, and they will do fine every year. Let it be. Let it go. Let it go. Um, yeah, I'm going to change it up a bit by talking about March Madness. Uh, what a start to this tournament. I am so hungry. Could not ask for more, not only as a college basketball fan, but as a sports fan. I mean, that is why people who don't pay a lick of attention to college basketball all season long tune in to watch March Madness. The emotion, the random Joes making 10 three-pointers in a game against Kentucky or 12, whatever the number was. I mean, it was incredible. You had everything you could want as a sports fan, and it was just a really fun weekend. And it's one of the best times of the year to be a sports fan, as I brought up a few weeks ago. But last night, there was no college basketball on, as I mentioned. And I thought, nice, a night of no drama. A night of just sitting there, enjoying some television with my wife. Then I remembered. The Bachelor finale was yesterday. No spoilers. You don't need to be afraid. No spoilers. But when I tell you the drama was only just beginning there on the ABC network, I'm telling you, I wasn't ready for what was happening. There were tears flowing in the Hederick household. The strings were being pulled by a puppet master. It was incredible television. No matter how corny you think those shows are, that was the realest reality TV I've watched in my entire life. For those two hours, my eyeballs were glued to that screen. And what a fitting ending through a tremendous season of The Bachelor on ABC. That's all I got to say. They're both about to log off before I can finish, because why the hell did I just talk about The Bachelor on this show? I'll tell you why, because I know Ethan's a fan of The Golden Bachelor, Gary. And he was in the live crowd going, hey there, everybody. And uh, Gary, Gary always loves, or Ethan always loves when I do that. So had to bring it up. I'm going to go take a copious amount of ibuprofen so I don't ramble like an idiot once we get done recording that's nate that's ethan i'm nick you're wonderful we'll see you next week thanks for joining us